Hey guys, Luca here. Today I just put together some of the key lessons that I have learned from my time working at Google and some of my observations and I hope this video will be insightful and useful for some of you. The first thing I want to talk about is imposter syndrome. For example, many people think that, oh, you are a software engineer at Google, then you must know everything. But turns out a lot of the software engineer at Google even suffer from imposter syndrome. When I first joined the company, I was like, wow, I actually don't know anything. There are a lot of more people who are more knowledgeable than me. They can do tasks a lot faster than me. They know the internal system so well. Like, it feels very overwhelming. And sometimes you may be struggling to even figure out how they achieve that level. And this could be interpreted as signs of imposter syndrome because you are constantly working with a lot of smart people and then you see people who are high achievers, then you subconsciously comparing to them and may, f and this can happen even at these big tech companies. So if you're someone who's just starting out of tech and who's thinking about becoming a software engineer and you think this is very tricky and challenging, trust me, like many people still suffer it today at these bigger tech companies. And that's why continuous learning and always pushing through a lot of these uncomfortable situations will separate you from others and what pushes you forward to become more knowledgeable and skillful. So I would say like, hey, yeah, don't worry that you are not familiar with a lot of things. Like try to get hands on and try to really always try to learn from people who are better at these tasks. And a lot of times experience and time are what's needed to become a very skilled developer. The second thing I learned is there are a lot of times that you might be learning coding online or doing class projects or grinding the code, but turns out a lot of these concepts aren't actually applicable to what you might be doing at your day-to-day -day job. For example, when you are interviewing LeetCode, it may not necessarily represent the type of team that you will be working on. Of course, a lot of the interview out there are trying to match you based on a team, but then again, the interview question doesn't apply what the day-to-day -day work will look like. So there could be that misalignment of what you're imagining the work might look like versus what you actually have to do. And a lot of times this gap has to be filled by you spending additional times outside of work potentially to read up either on technical books or ask the tech lead or people who are more experienced on the team to ask them for their guidance. And one of the biggest resources that you can leverage is code review. And a lot of times it's such a struggle to even come up to realization of how some of these things works, which can play into the first point that I was talking about imposter syndrome. And that's why as someone who's been through all this, I can truly say like, hey, like trust the process in a way that as long as you put in the time and energy, try to understand some of these code and try to see like what is the pattern and then take the feedback from your code review sincerely, then like, you know, slowly over time, you will see growth. And sometimes it may not be overnight, but day after day, month after month, like you will slowly pick it up. And that's something that a lot of times people don't realize is they do take time. And of course, now with the rise of AI, like a lot of these things can be shortened and people might feel even more stressed because a lot of technology might be able to do this way better. But of course, we haven't got to that point just yet. So I would say like right now, it's still very beneficial for a lot of us. And technology are here to help us to become a better developer. The third thing I want to talk about is internal tool. I always wonder like, wow, what's separating like a good software engineer versus like the rest? Like why do people think like Google software engineer is so much better? And I think a lot of it comes to the fact that Google just being around for so long that they have such amazing internal infrastructures. For example, the repo system, the monolithic. So for example, many company external uses GitHub or GitLab. And I used it too in college and you know, it's, it's nice, but it's really a struggle to use it sometimes. And some of the commits are really hard to use, but at Google, they have their own internal version. They call it Mercury, which a lot of other company might also use this. And it's also a public repo, but it's not as popular as GitHub. And a lot of these internal tools make it so much easier for you to manage some of these things. And they even have a designated internal team that works on some of these code reviewing pages, kind of similar to GitHub, where you send it out like a commit or pull request. And on there, you can review it. You can look at the differences very clearly, way more interactive and better than GitHub, in my opinion. And that made my life so much better and made me more efficient. And another thing is the fact that there are so many great internal storage sources 
like infrastructure a lot of times these scaling issues that you may run into when you are doing a startup or like a smaller company like uh, here at Google even if you are working on a zero to one projects they already have the infrastructure mostly figured out for you some other team have already done something similar that you can you know look at and then try to follow some of their blueprints and a lot of the times the internal documentation is also really well documented that allow you to pick up things really fast so I would say like yeah, like all of these together just make you way more and help you become more productive. And this also could be a trap because of the fact that they have all of these internal tools. That's unique to the internal. And now if you have to transfer teams or try to use some other tools outside, it might feel different. Like for example, I took some time trying to get over the fact that I no longer have these tools because like those tools made my life so much easier. They kind of suck you in. It kind of deter you away from moving external because the fact that some of these tools don't exist. For example, like when I built my full stack application, we used Java, but we never touched Spring Boot, which is one of the most popular Java package management like framework out there, but we didn't touch any of it. And we use our internal version. Sure, it's like kind of similar, like we use dependency injection, but the way you use it is also very different and the way you set it up can also be very different from like a typical Spring Boot. So it kind of make it so like, wait, I use all these internal tools, but now when I try to interview for externally, like, hey, like I never touched Spring Boot. Sure, like I can probably pick it up, but I can't say I have years of experience on this. So that can be something really tricky and deter people from moving away. And that's one aspect that I really miss about Google already. And I will make a separate video on some of these things. And the last thing I learned is design doc. <laughs> like, you will be surprised how many design docs I have wrote. And the fact is, a lot of times I will be writing a lot, but it's not code. It's a lot of documentations. I'm trying to capture a lot of the design that go into a feature implementation. Some of the edge cases, some of the project requirements, and try to figure out a lot of these aspects. And then I will go into the technical skill, like how I am planning to build this both on the front end and the back end. If I am changing up the back end, like will I change the database schema? How will I make sure the communication is established correctly? Will it cause any regression? A lot of these things help you prevent issues before it's being implemented. And I think this is a very good practice, but it's definitely very expensive because you have to put in a lot of hours into writing it and then send it out to your team and they have to spend time reviewing your doc as well. And a lot of times these docs can go anywhere from 10 to 20 pages, depending on the size of the feature. And of course, sometimes it's like a three to five pages if it's like a smaller feature. Of course, not all of them require a design doc, but a lot of the feature, especially if they require major changes, are required to have a design doc. One, to document some of these changes. So in case you leave, other people can pick it up very fast. Two, it also helps you to make a case when you do go for the promotion because one of the biggest things that they look at are these design docs. I think this is something that I really appreciated. Sure, like some other companies may not use this practice and they might think it's overkill because they just want you to go and write code anyways. But I still think it could be something beneficial. You don't have to spend as much time like what I did at Google, but definitely slowing down and really think about these design aspects, try to capture some of the pros cons solution, alternative solutions and try to think about all these. I think these are the critical thinking that's lacking from a lot of these lead code and then when you do do system design type of question, these are the things that help you. So I would say like these are some good practices that you know I truly think that Google did really nicely. So yeah, I would say these are some of the key lessons that I have learned while spending my time at Google. And now looking back, like, yeah, like I really appreciate the fact that the internal infrastructure is just so amazing that it really does make a difference on a developer's day-to-day -day life. Like another thing that I can share briefly is the fact that we didn't use many of the agile process that many other companies may have. For example, like Jira board or Confluences because we all had our internal way of managing a lot of these. And when you do a feature, for example, a lot of times is you have these type of engineering, cross engineering teams and on your design doc, you write the estimate time that required to implement each of these parts. For example, how long does it take to update the database schemas? How long does it take to 
create the backend services. A lot of these estimates will be on your design doc. Of course, it's not set to stone, but it helps you estimate how long this whole feature might take. And then you can, of course, always update it and then push back if necessary. But this is kind of like your way of managing your own task rather than having like some sort of Jira board. Of course, I can't speak for all the teams at Google, but based on my experiences, like these like Jira board isn't something that's extremely popular at Google. So yeah, I hope this video is helpful for those of you that are working in the industry or think or people who are thinking about going into it. And these are some of the most important lessons that I think that a lot of people should know. So yeah, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope this was uh, informative. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I will see you guys next time.